Welcome back. Let's Get Physical Therapy is an educational podcast brought to you by MedStar Health and hosted by me, physical therapist Becca Schumer. I will be sharing the mic with tons of healthcare professionals with the goal of educating and inspiring fellow PTs and future PTs. We hope you find this both informative and inspirational, ultimately optimizing how we treat our patients and grow as professionals. Please enjoy today's episode. Today, we've got Dr. Chris Luz, an orthopedic surgeon who is fellowship trained in sports medicine. A former professional baseball player within the Toronto Blue Jays organization, he has a personal passion for sports and wants his work to have a positive impact on the athletes of today and tomorrow. As part of the MedStar Sports Medicine team, Dr. Luz is a team physician for the Baltimore Orioles. Prior to joining MedStar Orthopedic Institute, he completed a fellowship at the Andrews Sports Medicine and Orthopedic Center, recognized globally as a leader in orthopedic patient care, research, education, and injury prevention. Dr. Luz earned his medical degree at the New York University School of Medicine, followed by completion of a residency at New York University Hospital for Joint Diseases. Today, we're talking all things baseball with Dr. Luz. Dr. Luz, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. So we're excited to have you on today to talk baseball, throwing shoulder, all the above. And I did a little prep for this, and I saw that you were part of the Blue Jays organization. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, a long time ago. Okay. I mean, you know, a lot of your colleagues were actually lacrosse players. <laughs> I know. It's one of the one of the hazards of being in the Maryland area. A lot of lacrosse, very, not as much baseball. But, you know, um, I, I think we do have some pretty good baseball. So, you know, it's been it's been exciting. I'm not actually from Maryland. I'm from Massachusetts originally. So uh, it's been a little bit of a, a cultural, I don't want to say shock, but just something that you, you got to learn about and get used to. But I would, um, I'm impressed with the amount of baseball and the, and the throwers that we have in the area. Definitely. So we kind of like to start with just how did you become an orthopedic surgeon? What got you into the field? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, growing up, I played baseball, but I also played hockey and football. I grew up in an area where, um, you know, I was lucky. I, I was able to play three different sports. And so that was a huge part of my life. And when you play that amount of sport, you know, you, you get injured and things happen. And so, um, I'd, I had a couple shoulder surgeries. I'd broken my hand and I was always impressed by the way that, you know, orthopedic surgeons could get you back on the field and get you, get you back doing something that you love. And that's very important to your life. And so, um, you know, I, I played college baseball and then I played minor league baseball for a little bit. And, you know, at some point along the way, you realize that baseball is going to be done and you're going to have to figure out something else to do. And so when I was thinking about it, you know, I, I, in the people that had had a big impact on my life, um, you know, orthopedic surgeon was was sort of high up on the list. And so um, that's that's how that came to be. You kind of get into shoulder right away. What how did you? Yeah. You know, which area you wanted to get into? Um, so there was always a natural affinity for upper extremity injuries just because I was a baseball player and I had a couple upper extremity injuries myself. Um, but you know, when you go through orthopedic training, it's, it's all the same. So you learn about trauma, you learn about foot and ankle, you learn about spine surgery. And, um, you know, the, the, once you get through orthopedic residency, then you have an opportunity to, to kind of pare down and decide what you, what you want to do in your fellowship, which is where, you know, you subspecialize into, into one of those areas. And with the sports medicine background, it was pretty clear that I wanted to go into sports medicine. Um, I was lucky, lucky enough to train at one of the premier sports medicine institutes the country down in uh, James Andrews place in Birmingham um, spent a year down there learning a lot about baseball injuries football injuries you know soccer basically across the board and um, you know just with my background I was always I was always interested in baseball players and I was always interested in shoulder and elbow and you know those types of surgeries and and so when I've gotten into practice that's really the stuff that I've gotten most involved in and so, you know, that's, that's, you know, it's been a sort of evolution over the course of time. And I think that's the way it is with most surgeons and most probably PTs as well. Mm -hmm. This is audio only, so we can't, the viewers can't see that you have your O's gear on your down spring training. Yeah. So it's a great, great kind of segue into what are some common injuries you're seeing from the get go, or what are some common injuries that you see in baseball players, not just pitchers, but all, all over. Yeah, so, uh, you know, obviously with our pitchers, uh, the majority of shoulder injuries are overuse and throwing related. And, um, you know, it, throwers are a little bit different in the sense that, 
you know, over the course of time, as you're growing up and as you're throwing a baseball, you develop these, you know, changes in the anatomy of the shoulder that make it somewhat difficult to, to determine what's normal for a thrower and then what's abnormal for a thrower. And so we should see changes in the labrum. We see changes in the rotator cuff. Uh, we see alterations in their range of motion. And so we kind of have to put it, put all that together to decide exactly what's going on with the player when they're having pain or dysfunction or they're not able to you know perform up to their capabilities because because uh, of a shoulder problem. And so you know we see we see a lot of labral tears, we see a lot of rotator cuff tendonitis, partial thickness rotator cuff tears. Um, but again, some of this is normal for them, and some of this is pathologic. And so we kind of have to figure out what which is which and what are the dynamic things that we can correct to take some of the stress off those structures. So. Those are the most common things. You're talking about the anatomical changes that occur. So it makes me think of youth athletes and kids throwing earlier and earlier and their, their pitch counts are very high up. What what are some kind of anatomical changes you might see in the youth athlete yeah, that isn't scheduled um, literature? Yeah, so they, they have pretty good literature out there uh, showing that, you know, it's it's a combination of soft tissue and bony change. So you know, your growth plates are obviously open when, when you're very young and they're susceptible to the stresses that you put across them. So, you know, in younger kids, we tend to see a lot of little eager shoulder, which is, you know, inflammation across the growth plate, just, you know, at the, at the proximal end of the humerus. Um, and, you know, along with that comes, you know, the, the, the rotational changes that we see in, that we see in kids. So, you know, pathologically, it's, it's growth, growth plate irritation, but in the non-pathologic sense, you know, they actually get um, more retroversion on the on the on the shoulder than what you see in a typical, um, you know, in, in actually in the contralateral shoulder. So um, they will develop side to side bony difference um, as as they grow older. Um, but then also you'll see an alteration in the arc of motion that they have. So typically their total arc will be about the same side to side. But then you'll see that you know the capsule and the and the labrum are a little bit more lax anteriorly and then a little bit more tight posteriorly. So the whole thing will be shifted towards external rotation. And you know I would say that is to a player, uh, you know what we see in, in our professional level guys and our college level guys and you know to ex to an extent our higher level high school guys. Given that we expect to see some of those changes and in PT, if we stretch them too much one way, we're actually doing them a disservice. So when does it become pathological or that difference become a concern? Yeah, um, you know I think it's a sort of a combination of things. There's been different studies out there that have looked at um, what is the internal rotation deficit that really defines injury. And, you know, that's anywhere from about 10 to 20 degrees of loss of total arc of motion in internal rotation. And what you'll find is that, you know, the really the posterior structures of the shoulder get very tight. So even if you put these players and we, we don't do this, you know, a lot of people don't do this quite as often. But if you if you make them lift both arms overhead, what you can see is that the scapula tends to come with their throwing side. And uh, it's just because of that tight, the tight posterior structures that they have they'll lose internal rotation. And, and really, it's, if they have anywhere between 10 and 20 degrees, 30 degrees, you know, that's really pathologic internal rotation deficit. But I think what you'll also find is that they become a lot less elastic. So when you put these guys into internal rotation, they kind of stop to motion. And that's something that I use uh, fairly often to kind of define whether or not a guy has a has something, has an internal rotation deficit that we can really stretch out and start to become more pliable with, um, you know, things like that as opposed to just somebody that just has an altered arc of motion. Those changes, that's where PT can come in great with dry needling and manual techniques and kind of restoring muscular balances throughout. But when do you, when would you kind of start going down the road of ordering imaging to look at things a little more deeply? Yeah, I, I think it depends on level of symptoms, uh, who the player is. You know, one of the things that, you know, sometimes gets lost in this is that we put, you know, we try and put all the pathology and, what's going on with these players into one tight little box, whereas each player is different and their level is different and, um, you know, what their expectations are, um, what their rehab needs are in terms of timeline. Um, so, you know, obviously if they fail non-operative management, you give them a good course of physical therapy, they're in with a good therapist, they're still having pain, they're still having dysfunction. That that's a, that's a pretty clear cut time to consider imaging. But if a guy is really bad off, he's got a lot of loss of range of motion, having a lot of pain, um, they have somewhat of a timeline where they need to get back and they need to make decisions, then I think that's also a pretty reasonable time to get imaging on the player.
And would that be, would you start with x-ray? Are you doing arthrograms? What's your, your course? Yeah. Um, so x-ray is typically to start. Um, and, that, you know, that doesn't typically show show a ton in these guys, but it's a good baseline examination. Uh, pretty simple and easy to do in the office. So that's usually where we start. I used to do arthrograms on a lot of them, but I think you lose some level of detail in, the, in our, you know, our, our more um, advanced MRI machines are really good at picking up lateral tears and you know joint pathology whereas they used to not be at that level so you know if you get it get into a good mri facility and you get a good mr good dry mri usually we don't need arthrograms um, and i really reserve arthrograms if there's a you know, confusing clinical picture that you know we have a baseline mri that you know is not necessarily matching up uh, your colleague dr levine told us all about shoulder instability and labral tears so kind of want to take take it more to like rotator cuff tears and partial tears when obviously you're not going to go and operate on most of these guys, a lot of them have probably have degenerative tears. What are some conservative efforts that we can do? Are there biologics that we can do like PRP or any of that to help these athletes stay in, stay on the field? Yeah, typically, um, you know, baseball players will have sort of undersurface degenerative impingement type tears. And, um, you know, typically you do not want to go in and fix those. The, the literature on that is, is pretty clear that if you fix that down, they lose too much motion. And um, we typically cannot get them back to throwing at a high level again. So, you know, if we are considering something operative, typically it's a, you know, it's a just a simple debridement plus or minus a labor repair. And in certain sort of salvage type situations, we may even do uh, something called a biceps tenodesis where we're moving the biceps tendon over off of that. Uh, superior labral tear that they get. Um, but that's a typically more salvage type situation. Um, outcomes of that particular surgery, you know, you look at return to play rates, they've all been somewhere between 60 and 70 percent. So the, uh, the the outcomes are not as high as what we'd like them to be. Um, you know, on the um, on the opposite end of that, you know, there's actually pretty good studies out there showing that if you simply repeat a course of therapy, a lot of times that will help players and the you know the return play rates are actually similar to surgery if you just repeat a good therapy program um, the additions that we can do to that so you know in the acute scenario where somebody's got a really inflamed shoulder a lot of times i like to add a cortisone injection to that or a steroid injection and that'll help just sort of calm things down we do get a lot you know i get a lot of com uh, concerns from players about is that just masking my pain and i think the the answer to that is that we use these things in sort of two different ways so one is Hey, look, we need to get this shoulder calmed down so that you can rehab. And that is certainly not a mess. That's a that's a treatment modality. And then there's the second area where, you know, a guy has to get back quickly and we need something to kind of jumpstart that that process. And, you know, we were pretty judicious in our use of cortisone injections in that regard. But sometimes we can use them in, in that sense to get a guy back quickly and, and try and uh, bring them back. But, you know, we're, we're pretty careful about doing that. So, you know, just when we're counseling the athlete, it's it. You know, these injections are really more in a, in a treatment and uh, modality. Uh, and then, you know, then there's the use of biologics. Uh, biologics for me have been a little bit of a second line treatment, but the use of PRP is, has shown to be pretty effective in shoulder pathology. Uh, the only note about that is that it typically slows the player down to start. So it can it can lengthen out the rehab a little bit, which not is not a bad thing in a lot of ways for these guys. Uh, but certainly something we're a little bit, you know, just a little bit more cautious in the use of. A lot of patients ask, is, is there a limit to how many injections that someone can have, safely have, in a shoulder? Yeah, yeah, and, and, and it, there, there certainly is. Uh, you know, one-time injection, I, I think, is it introduces very minimal risk or harm. Um, certainly PRP injections, you know, we can do those as many times as we want. There's no, there's no limitation there, other than the fact that you're going to get diminishing um, returns off of it. Uh, steroid injections, you know, really in a, in a young thrower, you know, two, three, maybe max over an extended period of time. But if you're starting to fail multiple cortisone injections, it's usually time to consider something surgical. And I would tell you, the guys that stay on top of their rehab and guys that are in with a good therapist and, and really are paying attention to stuff, we, we rarely have to do that. You keep mentioning having a good therapist. What, do, what, does, yeah. that mean? what does that mean to you? <laughs> Uh, well, you know, like therapists, like orthopedic surgeons or, you know, pretty much everything we do, they, they come in, you know, sort of different flavors, right? So some therapists really like doing knees and rehabbing knees. Others focus in the rehab of you know, our geriatric patients. And, you know, some really focus in on, on the upper extremity. And, you know, if we can get, you know, 
our patients into the therapist that treats them the best, that typically is what works out the best for them. And so, you know, we have got, and as you know, at, at MedStar, we've got a lot of therapists that, you know, specialize in the treatment of baseball players. And so they've got a lot of experience of what a baseball player's shoulder looks like, how it's supposed to look at certain points of the rehab, and then what the milestones they're supposed to be hitting, and then how we bring them through an interval throne program and things like that. And it just takes time to develop those, you know, the sort of clinical acumen to really understand where the player is at in their rehab and when to push them, when to pull them back, when to call a surgeon. And it just comes through experience and time. And so if you can find a therapist that has that, then typically I've found that the outcome is 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 better. What kind of communication are you looking for? Because these baseball throwing shoulder injuries, they can take a long time to get better and get them back to throwing at speed and, and distance and all of that. So throughout this process, how much communication are you having with the PTs? Obviously, it depends on if you're on the professional level versus high school versus college. But yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great question, and and it's and it's a hard question because, um, you know, every as I said as I said earlier, every player is a little bit different and at a different level. So, you know, when when a guy's progressing through or girl for that matter uh, is is progressing through their milestones, and they're doing really well, then we don't need a ton of communication. Usually, I just like to see the player at interval follow up, and as long as the player's exam and clinical progress is going well then, um, you know, it's just usually communication via the player and or, you know, therapy prescription. Um, you know, the, the times that I need to know about it are, you know, when the, when the player is not progressing, when they're continuing to have pain and discomfort. And, you know, ag- again, this, this comes with, you know, different, le- different levels of experience with the, you know, with the therapist. There are certain therapists where I, you know, completely trust and, and you know, believe that they're going to be doing the right things and they're going to be moving the player along and kind of, um, keeping them at the right pace. Whereas, you know, certain other therapists are not quite as experienced and, you know, it's better to have more communication because they just need, um, you know, more communication just to understand where the player is at and, and, and what they need. And so, you know, I think if there's any question, then I like to know about it, but, um, you know, if the, th- if the, if the player's doing well and, you know, moving along and it's just a little hiccup or minor setback and you can push them through, then, you know, I think that that's okay as well. When is it appropriate for an athlete to push through pain or not push through pain? What kinds of conversations are you having? Let's go with the youth athlete and when parents are involved. Yeah, yeah. So I, I always tell people um, it's normal to have some soreness after throwing. It's abnormal to have a lot of soreness and pain. And so, you know, the the things I'm looking for are what is your response to a little bit of downtime? So, you know, if you have pain the day that you throw, how does it respond the next day, two days, three days? If that pain goes away and, you know, your range of motion stays good and your strength still feels good and you're able to go out and play catch and and everything feels okay, then I think that that's okay. Uh, Pain that sticks with you is is obviously a problem. So if you're not getting better in between outings, um, that's certainly a problem. Uh, Very severe pain. You know, obviously, if a player is in a lot of pain, then then we need to get them checked out. Um, And then, you know, the other thing is if they're losing range of motion, if they're losing strength. Um, and if they're losing performance metrics, so if you find that they're, um, you know, they're having increased soreness and pain and they're losing fastball velocity or losing command of the baseball, those are all things that are kind of red flagish for me that we need to get this player in, we need to get them seen and kind of figure out what's going on. We know that sport specialization is crazy, crazy, crazy. How much in an ideal world, how much time would you how how much time would you like to see an athlete take off from throwing or from a sport per year? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, it it really depends on the level of oversight, level of player insight into their own body and things like that. I would say at the youth level where things are much less controlled than what we have at the professional level, uh, you know, the recommendation is about three months off from throwing a year. and And I think that's pretty reasonable gives kids time to play other sports, do other things, uh, gives their arm a chance to rest and recuperate, which is very important. And, um, you know, I, I think that that's a pretty good number. And during that time, you know, we, we always call it rest and downtime, but it's not really 
rest and downtime. It's, it's active downtime. So they should be involved in cardiovascular activity. They should be involved in other sports if they can, you know, really developing their their muscle coordination and agility in other ways that maybe baseball doesn't promote and makes them a better athlete overall. Um, and then getting on a good shoulder maintenance program. And so, you know, even when you're down from throwing, you know, it doesn't mean you can't continue to work on your scapula, work on your posture and work on the other things that'll make you healthy when you do get back to throwing. In my practice, I see a lot of patients and athletes post-op ACL and we're seeing like multiple tears in the high school athlete. How does this compare to the overhead athlete and recurrence of injury, especially when these injuries are starting earlier and earlier? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, guy, it's, it's sort of, you know, common sense, but you know, if, if someone's got a, got an issue, then they tend to continue to have that issue. So there's something biomechanically about a lot of these kids that, you know, predisp- predisposes them to shoulder or elbow pain. And it might be something about the mechanics, about the way they throw, the, about the way their body moves or about the, you know, muscle balance that they have. Um, and sometimes it's just, you know, it, particularly these younger kids, and, and I tell them all the time, sometimes it's just about growth. And sometimes they're, you know, they hit their growth spurt, their, you know, the, the relationship between the bones, muscles, ligaments, tendons is all changing. And that's just putting abnormal stresses across the shoulder and elbow. And so, I think that we do see a lot of recurrence of injury, but again, I, I think a lot of this stuff is correctable in the sense that if we can evaluate their, their pitching mechanics and get them to throw a little bit better, if we can evaluate their you know biomechanics, if we can get their scapula moving better, if we can get their range of motion better, and we can convince them to stay on good maintenance programs from those ends, I think we can get them through this stuff with minimal you know, risk and keep them on the field and keep them performing well. Just like anything, right? Getting them early before they're hurt to analyze these things to figure out their risk of injury would be ideal. Yeah, yeah. Or just early on in the process, if if we can just get them plugged in and make sure they're doing the right stuff. And, you know, another thing to note is that, you know, I, I do get a lot of parents that come in and say, hey, look, we did all the right things and he still got hurt. And, you know, the, the bottom line is this, they're, they're playing a sport. There's going to be some baseline level of risk there. We work our best to give recommendations on how we can prevent this stuff, but it happens and and it, and it, and it will continue to happen. Um, but the point is, is once it does, we got to respond appropriately and make sure that we're doing the right stuff for the kid. And so that that's the really the point that I try and emphasize with parents is that, you know, we do our best to get to them early. We do our best to try and prevent injury, but then we do our best to respond to injury when it happens. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the kid did something wrong or the parent did something wrong, but it's just something we got to, we got to make sure we stay on top of. What kind of conversations are you having with parents when, you know, they think their kid is the next best athlete in the whole wide world and more is better. And they're afraid that shutting them down will limit Joey from making it to the major leagues. How do you kind of have that talk about overuse injuries and the importance of active recovery? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I just point to our professional guys, right? And these are guys that are performing at the highest level. And I have conversations with these guys all the time. And, you know, they, they take time off and, and they let their bodies rest and they focus on recovery and then focus on what they can do mechanically to help themselves from year to year. And there's a pretty high premium and emphasis on that. And there's a lot of research going into how these guys can best let their body recover so that they can perform their best, so they can develop their best. And that, you know, ultimately they, they can be the best player that, that they can. And, you know, if, if we're looking at that at the youth level, why are we going to tell our kids to throw 12 months out of the year, max effort, you know, huge spikes in the amount that, in volume that they're doing um, when we're not telling our professional guys to do that. So, you know, it's, it's important to get that downtime. It's important to, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to say limit volume because you, you need some level of volume to pitch and perform, but to avoid those things that are really putting us at high risk. What advice would you give a, say, a new grad, new PT grad interested in getting into baseball medicine? How would you suggest they kind of get into it? Yeah, um, that, that's a good, that's that's a good question. Uh, you know, I think um, you know, be showing interest and um, asking and talking to people that are already involved, right? So if if you're a young PT, you're a young orthopedic surgeon, you know, you have to be eager, you have to be active, and you have to start to develop relationships with people that are in the business, right? So. 
you can find people within your system. And, you know, for the most part, you know, hospital systems these days have therapists and people that specialize in, in lots of different areas. And so I think if you're very active in getting involved with those people, get in, get involved in their meetings, get in, you know, act, you know, ask if you can shadow them in clinic and see what they're doing um, and get involved in, in the stuff that's not in the clinic. And so the stuff that you might have to, you know, go drive and, and, you know, spend your off time doing, you know, I've, I've done a lot of, you know, screens with Steve Luca where we're at a baseball academy at eight o'clock at night. Right. So you just got to get involved in that stuff and, and, and just be active and understand that you have to work to kind of get there. You can't just sit there in your clinic ex and expect it to come to you. Great advice. What is your favorite quote? We're kind of asking all of our guests what a favorite quote of yours is that moves you. It does not have to be baseball related, but what's a quote that drives you? Uh, go big or go home. <laughs> Just, I, I think, I think it, it, it I don't know. I, I think anything you do, you gotta, you gotta be involved. You gotta be active and, and you have to go for it, right? You can't, you can't sit back and expect it to come to you. So. All right. Where can people find you? On our webpage. So on the MedStar webpage, so you can find me there. Uh, I see patients in Timonium in um, Bel Air and then over at Franklin Square. So I've got a pretty, pretty wide range. And, um, you know, those are the spots. Thanks so much for your time. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Yep. See ya. Thanks for listening to the Let's Get Physical Therapy podcast. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram at Messar Health PT. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please give us a five-star rating and leave a review so we can reach more listeners just like you. As always, we appreciate your time and hope you join us for our next episode.